Okay, let's look at some catches, some things that can make our decision-making process risky and risky for our patient. So bias is something that can affect our, and infect, I think, our decision-making process in ways that make it difficult for us to find the true cause and actually care for our patient. Biases, I think, also are derived from some of our ego. Our ego is often telling us that we're right, that we have the knowledge that we need to get X, Y, and Z done, especially as we become more burned out and as we have more experience. But we're still at risk, even with experience and especially with burnout, of missing things. And so when we're talking about biases, we're trying to make sure that we keep seeking truth and that our assessment process isn't going to deviate by things that are untrue, but still are thought of the human process. So let's think first about how we come up with diagnoses. When we make a diagnosis for our patient in EMS, we generally don't call it specifically a diagnosis. Now, I do believe that we diagnose patients. You couldn't treat a patient without having some type of diagnosis, but we call it things like our differential diagnosis. We have maybe other terms for it, but in the end, the one that's most useful is rule out. So the rule out is a little bit of a negative process and sometimes it's hard for people to understand. But our rule out process, our means of getting to our diagnosis through our differential diagnosis, our working or presumptive diagnosis, all very similar terms, helps avoid the biases. So let's first kind of talk about managing a patient, if you will. So we've got a patient that is injured from whatever injury. And let's say that it involves uh, core organs. When I think of a rule-out process, I think of it starting out really wide, like the base or the widest part of a triangle, and then hopefully if all the tools work for us and we have what we need, may not just be the knowledge and our ability, it might just be we can't assess certain things because we don't have the tool to assess it, eventually we should end up with a diagnosis. And so I'll call that the rule-out. And so as we do this, we start off in the initial phase during our maybe doorway view and our primary assessment saying, okay, assuming maybe there's no big life threats I have to address, I can carry on with my assessment. I think it might be an injury that could include these things. Let's say the person's been injured in the chest with blunt force trauma. Well, there's a lot of things in the chest and it depends on how they were injured, how much force was applied and what type of device they were struck with to determine how severe their injury is. But because things are so cl closely packed in the chest and the abdomen and the torso, that stuff is at risk of having multiple injuries to multiple organs. And so if we start off with this wide assumption thinking the chest injury could involve things like the lungs, our heart, the vessels, our airway, to start with, we actually have a lot that we have to look at and we can't easily treat all of these things at the same time with the same treatment. We'll probably need multiple treatments to treat all of these things. Now, it's sometimes that all of these things are injured, but often we're looking at one injury that's the worst case scenario. So let's say in this patient, we start assessing them and we start off with things like, we notice that they have some dyspnea. They, they have an injury to their chest and they're having difficulty breathing. Okay, listening to lung sounds will be important in this phase. Getting a ventilatory rate, get, making sure their airway's intact, all the things that our primary assessment will dictate to us, not necessarily the order I just gave you. But let's say that I get to the point that I've assessed the airway, airway's open. Okay, it's not an injury directly to the airway. I listen to lungs and the lungs are clear. It's not the lungs. As I progress down my assessment, I start to narrow the choices that may be the worst case scenario or the thing that I need to treat. So now I'm left with maybe as I get narrower, lungs was knocked out up here as was airway. Now I've got fewer things to worry about, heart and vessels. Well, I check the patient's blood pressure, heart rate, all those things in the course of my primary and as I make my way to my secondary survey. And let's say that I identify that mm, it doesn't seem like it's just great vessels. I'm not worried about necessarily a uh, separated or lacerated aorta, but I am showing signs of cardiac insufficiency. Perhaps what's ending up happening is I have cardiac tamponade in my patient. Well, I've narrowed down from a wide assessment to a 
limited assessment. And I did so by saying, mm, my assessment tools tell me it's not this, it's not this. But when I get to the heart, I can't disprove, I can't disprove, I cannot rule out that it's an issue at the heart. I cannot rule out X. The thing that you can't rule out, the thing that your assessment doesn't get off the table of choices, that's your diagnosis. So there's risk here though that when we initially assess our patients, our bias can get in the way. So if we come up to a patient and we assume to that patient has a condition just by maybe the doorway view, we haven't done the other assessment, and we assume that they have X condition, we start assessing them, but we only assess to prove that we're correct. Maybe it's even something that we thought of later. It wasn't our first decision. If we're only proving something to be correct, and we're not looking for the things it could be, but we're just proving our ego that we're right, that's confirmation bias, right? So proving you're right. We don't work that way. We disproved everything else by our rule out process. And that which we cannot rule out is our diagnosis. Now, the anchor type of bias is a little similar, but it's our first assumption becomes the anchor for all of our other assumptions. And so when we're assessing the patient, we may start looking only at the things that prove that it's this thing. And regardless of the information we receive otherwise, we stick with it being our first choice. And so again, I think these are probably big ego risks that we have in our patient care. Nevertheless, whichever type of bias that we have infecting our process, it will steer us away from our truth. It'll muddy our assessment, our analyzation, and our planning, and will probably put us in words to essentially miss something big, miss the worst case scenario. All right, now let's look at how we make these decisions and we do our critical thinking in environments in which we're under extreme pressure. Now, that's pretty much any time we have a critical patient, and maybe when we have non-critical patients as well. So before we talk about making this decision process under pressure, let's talk about what pressure actually is. Pressure is really nothing more than stress. It can come in many different forms, and often that stress is not actually very conducive to our process. So when we're under pressure, we're dealing with the effects of stress, which if we think physiologically then, is essentially just an adrenal response. Adrenaline and the sympathetic, sorry, sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system is going to change the way we think, right? Back to that fight or flight, feed and breed. It's making decisions of, can I do this or that? It doesn't look at global decisions. It's even your eyesight will physically change when you have an adrenal response. And so how do you deal with adrenaline affecting your decision-making process on a, a scene that's unfolding very rapidly. Well, we need to make good decisions and we don't want to rush to a decision just to make it fast and risk that it's not a good decision. So what we have to do is essentially look at ways in which we can prepare ourselves to better manage stress. It's not possible to just suddenly wake up one day and be in a stressful situation and without preparation, figure out how to get out of that situation. Because your thought process is going to be narrowed dramatically by this, you're going to not think the same way you would if you were in a normal state, like our non-sympathetic state. And so preparation under stressful conditions can bring us to stress inoculation. Let's take some of this from the military, if, if you don't mind. I'm reading a great book called On Combat, and that book is describing essentially what the body and the person physiologically and psychologically go through when they're in situations like being shot at, being a soldier, working as a law enforcement officer. In those situations when your life is on the line through essentially the threat of violence, you're is extremely rate of danger of being harmed or even harming yourself or others inadvertently. And so military members, law enforcement officers, and even folks like EMTs and firefighters are going through stress inoculation for their environment. And stress inoculation essentially means putting you through a system of stressful scenarios when it doesn't have someone's life on the line. So think practice, putting yourself through stressful scenarios and helping you find a means of managing your way through it so that eventually when you are in that stressful situation, your body knows what to do. And a large part of this is going to be muscle memory. So in that idea with muscle memory, 
memory and let's say the stuff that isn't muscle memory that's just brain memory that stuff all involves hours and hours of repetitious thought and practice so in your downtime when not responding to calls if you have gone through your initial phase of EMT training where we go through lots of scenarios and stress inoculation how many scenarios and stress inoculation events outside of the calls you're running do you practice to make sure that your peak effectiveness occurs when you're still under that sympathetic response? I know the answer. Most people, they do the bare minimum. And so that puts you at risk of not being able to meet those challenges. Then there's the idea of even if you have stress inoculation, that's only generally for certain situations. In situations that are similar, we can have many challenges that come up. And so you have to also prepare by expecting and practicing challenges. Sometimes I'll give this idea to my students. I'll ask uh, in class, how many folks um, have a weapon in their vehicle? And we live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is quite violent. So I'd recommend most people that are uh, cognizant and able to own one should probably own one and be prepared. But if you have a weapon in your vehicle and you're driving down the road and all you did was you go to the range every now and then, maybe it's an indoor range, you fire a weapon, you make sure you're proficient. Then you put the weapon in your vehicle and you drive down the street. You shouldn't assume that if someone takes you by surprise and tries to carjack you, and maybe you have kids in your vehicle and you need to defend them, if someone tries to carjack you just because you shot inside of a closed environment or an outside environment, a static environment, not in the conditions that you're under right now, and because you have the weapon with you doesn't mean that you're going to be successful at escaping that environment, even though you may be stress inoculated as a firefighter or EMT. And so what do you have to do? Well, just think of this analogy with law enforcement. Law enforcement officers, when they get a new vehicle, they're told essentially, after they've had a vehicle for a while, you need to sit in your vehicle and over effectively hundreds of times, open the door handle in your vehicle over and over and over again. Why do they do that? Well, if I had initially a Crown Victoria and I moved my way up to a Tahoe, if I get in the vehicle and I go on a call and on that first call, I have to exit the vehicle rapidly, my muscle memory is to reach up here where the Crown Victoria handle is, not down here where the Tahoe handle is, which means I won't be able to get out of the vehicle fast enough and it will probably cause what? More stress. So if you want to be good at responding to the carjacker, you need to be practicing or at least thinking through the situation of going in response to someone surprising you at a stoplight or otherwise and still being to, able to effectively do your job. So those are pretty extreme examples, but it is more violent for EMS providers now than ever before. So it's important that you're thinking through these processes beforehand. So take time to do things like not just run scenarios or think through scenarios, but Run scenarios that have different challenges in the same type of scenario. Work through, what will I have to troubleshoot if X, Y, and Z goes wrong? Or A, B, and C goes wrong? In doing that, you're giving yourself the tools and the thought process when you're not under stress to be able to do this when you're under stress. Also, things like having good nutrition and having slept well will contribute to your ability to work under stress. Think about when you've had to work a shift, maybe you work overnight, maybe you work 48 hour shifts or 12 hour shifts, whatever it is, after you've run a couple shifts or run some calls and you're kind of tired, are you more irritable? What happens when you're under more stress? Do you become less irritable? Probably not. So it's these challenges that we need to think about beforehand so that they're already pre-planned in our brain when the event comes up. There are some ethical considerations to take into account in all of this, biases, making the right decision. And when we talk about events and trauma like multiple casualty incidents, ethics becomes a very important role because we'll have to look at things differently than our normal ethical framework. So let's look at some ethical principles called principalism.